Welcome to the Cardis Relocation Playbook webinar, Business as Unusual, Navigating Global Mobility's Next Normal. My name is Marilyn Gilio Knapp, and I'm Vice President in Cardis's Global Talent Mobility Group, and I will be your moderator for the next hour. I'd like to begin with a little housekeeping for today's session. The webinar is being recorded, and we will make it available to you after the session. All attendees will be in listening mode only for the entire event. At the end of the session, if we have time, I will be opening it up to the audience for Q&A. If you have a question in reference to today's topics, you can submit it through the Q&A portal and feel free to direct your question to a specific panelist if you wish. To help our panelists answer questions in specific order, we ask that you please give the question a thumbs up if you'd like to see that specific question or questions answered. Questions with most likes or thumbs up will be answered first. Let's meet our panel for today. Joining us in this webinar will be Marissa Johnson, Senior Manager, Global Services at Textron, Melissa Meyer, Director, Global Mobility at MasterCard, and Trish McDonald, Director, Global Mobility at Westinghouse. I will let them speak to their roles and experience during the opening question. In the meantime, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Today's webinar will focus on the content published in our latest Cardis Relocation Playbook, which features Textron and Marissa herself as a key collaborator. It really is a must read for mobility professionals. So if you haven't downloaded it yet, email cardissolutions at cardis.com to receive a copy. Providing industry insights and creative solution to today's and tomorrow's relocation challenges, our relocation playbook is designed to help you plan proactively. And that's what we'll be focusing on today. What steps are organizations taking to prepare for the future? And will the mobility landscape really be the same as it was pre-pandemic? So let's get started. My first question is to each of you. Is it really business as usual out there in the world of global mobility? Marissa, let's start with you. Are we beginning to return to pre-pandemic normality or is the impact of COVID-19 still prevalent? Thanks so much, Marilyn. You know, you asked us to do a little, little introduction. And so um, I'm Marissa Johnson. I've, I've been with Textron for 20 years now in the mobility space for much of that time. And certainly this is unprecedented and nothing like anything I've ever seen before. We've been through, um, at least for me personally, the challenges in 2001 um, and then the challenges in 2008. And then now this, you know, this economic challenge that we're facing now in the midst of a global pandemic and certainly unprecedented in terms of what's happening in the mobility space for Textron and our program. I think for us, you know, business is rebounding. Things are becoming more normal and yet, and yet they're not. There's supply chain disruptions. There's challenges with our manufacturing. Um, things like uh, we, we make fuel tanks as part of what Textron does. And as everyone is aware, the automakers are having trouble getting chips for their vehicles that they produce. And when they do get chips for those vehicles, then they hurry and make a bunch of vehicles. And so when they need to hurry and make a bunch of vehicles, then they need fuel tanks and other parts for those, for those cars and trucks that they're making, which then ramps up our demand very quickly. And so it's this sort of ebb and flow that we're seeing right now as we're sort of sputtering to get back to normal um, production across our business lines. I think, um, you know, people today, as we're getting ready to send people on assignments, we have lots of domestic moves that are happening, probably about the same volume as we have had in years past. Some of that is pent up demand, relocations that were put on hold and that are now coming um, and, and moving back into our into our process stream. Um, but we also have assignees who are going on expat assignments who have different concerns today than they did a year ago. So for Textron, one of the things that we have worked on over the past year is implementing a points-based policy for our long-term assignees. 
to give them some more flexibility. We feel like if they're concerned about family now um, and, and maybe leaving some family behind in the home country or making more trips home or somehow managing their assignment a little bit differently than they otherwise would have with some different concerns that the global pandemic has now sort of brought to the forefront, we felt like maybe an even more flexible policy than what we had before would be useful. So. We took the time when business was down a little bit last year to implement that points based policy and I'm hoping that as we start to see more assignments come back online that our employees will feel like that is um, an advantage to them that they can take the policy components that are available and use them to address some of these new concerns that frankly they wouldn't have thought of about a year ago. Thanks Marissa. Certainly adaptability and flexibility are key post pandemic. Melissa, could you share your thoughts from a MasterCard perspective? Yes, thank you. So first off, just an introduction. My name is Melissa Meyer and I am a director of global mobility at MasterCard. I've been at MasterCard for seven and a half years. I've also worked at mobility before this at Ernst & Young and Goldman Sachs. Um, and I, I'm really happy to be here today. Um, so I would say, you know, I would echo a lot of what Marissa said about things starting to get back to normal. Um, for MasterCard, we just announced our return to work plan a couple of weeks ago and opened up our business travel. And we are starting to see some more movement, but mostly it's in the domestic movement within the same country because there's no immigration issues. And we're still seeing a lot of dif difficulties to travel internationally and immigration delays and changes that are ongoing. So um, the hope is that in the future, when that settles down a bit, there'll be more international moves and, and short and long-term assignments that we're seeing. But we are just seeing some senior leadership strategic moves based upon future direction of our company coming out of the pandemic. And that usually drives more, um, more future moves. Um, you know, we'll, we'll hope to see that when borders open up a little more fully. Melissa, thanks for sharing, really insightful. Trish, how about Westinghouse? Is it business as usual for HR mobility team at your organization? Thank you, Marilyn. So hi, everyone. Um, also happy to be here today. As Marilyn mentioned, I am the director of global mobility at Westinghouse. I've been in the industry for around 15 years and I'm in my fourth year here at Westinghouse. Uh, our team is centralized, so we are based in the US and we manage all mobility programs here at Westinghouse. So Marilyn, I wouldn't say it's business as usual um, out there in the world of mobility. Um, certainly not for Westinghouse. Um, from a domestic relocation point of view, um, we are still seeing um, some of our permanent relocations that remain on hold, and that's largely due to return to office decisions uh, and decisions made around the role and where it can be performed. So, for example, can the role be performed remotely or does the role require an employee to be within commuting distance to an office or does the role require the employee to be in the office on a full time basis? So some of those decisions have yet to be made, even though our US, real, US locations uh, opened up on, on June 1st. And then from an international expatriate perspective, we have seen some movement in this space uh, with regards to new assignments. Uh, certainly not business as usual yet. We are still dealing with, um, you know, certain constraints due to COVID. Uh, one of them being, you know, expatriates uh, able to obtain their second vaccination dose, either, you know, before the expatriate in their home country or when they are in the host country. So that's one little nuance that we've been dealing with lately. Um, also, expatriates are hesitant to to relocate with family due to host country COVID restrictions that remain in place. So um, we have some expatriates who've decided that they will go on assignment without the family and then they will join them. They will join them later. And then we've had, you know, some issues with home leave. Uh, we have a number of expatriates um, who are in China and our recommendation, of course, is that they don't leave because um, of the difficulties in, in getting them and their families to return. So that's another issue that we've been dealing with. And then, of course, into the United States, we do have some expatriations 
uh, into the US and um, you know the US travel ban, particularly from Europe, is presenting some problems, not only for our expatriates, but also our extended business travelers. So there are still many COVID you know, related challenges that we continue to face. So I really don't see us getting back to business as usual, um, at least not until we're well into 2022. Trish, thank you for that. And sure. thank you all of you for those responses. One of the key uh, topics that we discuss in the Cardis Relocation Playbook is duty of care and how employees are now expecting more from their HR mobility teams in terms of health and wellness support. Marissa, how far should an organization's duty of care extend? Where does the company's role begin? And when supporting its relocating employees? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And I really can maybe only talk to some of the decisions that Textron has made throughout the pandemic, but I think this is really um, a tough question in some cases. And for us, uh, there's just not a one size fits all and we've had to make decisions on a case by case basis. So maybe I could just share a few examples with you all and um, some of the experiences that we've had and hopefully this resonates with you and and maybe we can get, get into this more during the Q&A session. But at the height of the pandemic for Textron, you know, we support a lot of military uh, customers or we we have products like helicopters that are acting as air ambulances for countries um, around the globe. And so it's it's challenging um, to say to a country that is in the middle of a pandemic, yes, sorry, we, we can't help you, right, to, um, to get this piece of equipment up and running. And so some of that was just not an option for us. And, and obviously supporting our military when they're embedded in a war zone is also not an option. In some instances, we actually had employees who the decision was made that it was safer for them to remain on a base in the middle of a war zone than it was for them to come home um, in the middle of a global pandemic. And those were challenging issues that had to be addressed for us and the logistics trying to get people evacuated um, from those kind of locations was really tough for us. Um, we had employees who who felt like their children and their and their spouses were no longer safe in the location where they were on assignment and they wanted their children and their spouses to be evacuated to a safer location. So one example was we had an employee in China at the height of the pandemic at the beginning of 2020 and his family left to go to Spain. Well, then, of course, you all know what happened in Spain. And so then he wanted his family out of Spain. And where do they go from there? Right. And it just sort of is this um, this question of of how far do you go as a company to accommodate some of these requests and to keep people safe? And in some cases, where where do you send them that's safe? And so then his family wanted to go back to China because things were settling down in China with the pandemic. So we had to get him back in the country, which is which is nigh impossible at this point um, to get people back in. And so it took us about a month um, to get him back into China. Um, one of the things that we saw as we tried to um, to continue to service equipment like the air ambulance that I talked about, the helicopters, uh, was trying to get countries to let our folks in. A lot of countries were um, allowing people to enter the country with an emergency letter that said there was an emergency service uh, that was required that would allow them an exemption to enter, but they wanted proof of insurance that we would cover all any, any and all costs associated with COVID if the person were to get sick when they were in country. So we worked with our insurance provider to draft a letter that would say, yes, in fact, we would, we would cover these employees. Um, we had people asking for um, now at this point, can they come back to their home country to get a vaccine, which is probably a question that a lot of you are wrestling with. And again, I would I would say there's probably no right answer, but we have allowed employees to um, to use their home leave budgets. We've not paid for a trip separately, but if they want to use their home leave budget to return home, they can. And then we've worked with them on if you have to get back into your host location and there's some quarantine requirements, um, we'll give you some additional time off to meet those quarantine obligations in the country that you are traveling to. So 
those are just a few examples as of some things that we, you know, hard questions that we had to ask when you're trying to keep employees safe, um, still trying to run a business, still trying to service products that are mission critical in some locations, um, and, and try and balance that out. And hopefully those examples um, resonate with some of you as well. Marissa, thank you. Clearly a very delicate balance that the pandemic and duty of care uh, created for many of us on this call. Thank you for sharing that. So the pandemic has forced us all to adapt the way in which we work. Uh, Melissa, what steps are you taking to align MasterCard's current remote work policy to the post-pandemic world? Thank you. So at MasterCard, we had to, I guess, quickly develop a policy after we did an all employee survey, um, I guess last fall to see where everyone was at and realized that we had no clue where people were. They were all over the world um, and we really had no idea how to put parameters around this. So we we have an interim policy, which um, we are using right now. Um, we just recently announced our return to office approach, which we're calling together is priceless. Priceless is MasterCard's you know, tagline. So what we're trying to tell people is that we want everyone to come back together to be in person. We have a whole sort of marketing campaign for employees. We did a bunch of webinars. Um, we're very transparent about the desire that we want to interact together and interact with our colleagues in person. And we feel that this is the time to do it. But we are only requiring people to come back two days a week. Um, and offices are opening on a staggered approach. So, um, for example, our New York City Tech Hub recently opened about a week ago and our Arlington, Virginia, where we have some more of our junior employees, which are the employees that we have been hearing about that want to get back to the office, that want to you know, interact with others. So um, it's been good so far. We've had really positive feedback. And what we decided for our remote policy is that we would have controlled flexibility. So we do allow six months of remote work in any location as long as there's you know not an issue with working in that location um, but we allow it with senior level approval from the business and hr and we have a signed remote work agreement that we put into place for anything above six months for remote work and personal permanent moves we do have to evaluate these with an additional level of review of our corporate tax team and payroll teams if it can be done from those standpoints, we allow it. If not, we unfortunately have to deny the arrangement. Um, and that's working well right now because we are trying to be understanding as much as we can to people's individual circumstances. However, in the future, the intention at MasterCard is to return to the office. We want people to return to their physical office. We want things to get back to normal. And what we're doing when we look at our uh, remote work policy, which we're currently building out and developing, is we're looking at our future of work. What, what is it going to be like in our future? Um, and we are working with the team that's developing that and really trying to align our remote work policy to where the company is going in the future. We want to look at where our company is going to be in two to three years from now and design a remote work policy for that versus just coming out of this post pandemic world um, in this interim time. So it is a bit forward thinking of how we see work um, revolving and it is still being uh, developed, but it, it's, it's exciting to see that these things are aligning together, which I think will be very helpful for our employees and enhance their experience. Great, Melissa. Thank you. It's great to hear that we're not looking at just post pandemic, that uh, we're looking beyond that. Really important. Okay, Trish, I believe Westinghouse has developed a remote work policy that goes beyond COVID-19. Could you share the details of the policy with this audience? Sure, Marilyn. So, so back in March of this year, um, Westinghouse revised what's called uh, their work uh, workplace standards policy. So, but prior to the revision, the company completed a voice of the customer survey. So they polled the employees across the world on how they would like to see uh, work for work working moving forward. So overwhelmingly, employees wanted more flexibility. So the policy, the workplace standards policy was revised to identify three distinct groups of employees. So those that are 100% remote, uh, 
Those that are mobile, so meaning that they spend a few days in the office and the rest of the time at home, and really they, that arrangement is worked out between the employee and their manager. And those um, that are identified as anchors, so those that spend 100% of their time in the office. So from a US domestic perspective, employees are permitted to work from any state, provided that Westinghouse has registered payroll in that state. So if we have an employee who's elected to work remotely, provided that arrangement works for that role, they can work in another state, provided Westinghouse has a payroll. Um, you also have for our mobile workforce, uh, they must be within commutable distance from a Westinghouse office. And we really don't define the number of miles um, that are commutable because, you know, what is reasonable to one person uh, may not be reasonable to another individual. Um, and then for anchors, of course, they spend 100% of their time in the office. And then from an international perspective, I, I would love to say we can work from anywhere, but really the reality is that's not possible today for Westinghouse. So employees are not permitted to work from anywhere. So a request must be made via a formal process. Um, should an employee have a, a reason to, to need to work from another country? And each request is assessed on a case by case basis. And usually the circumstances surrounding the request are unique to that individual, hence why we look at it case by case. I will say that it's not common for these requests to be approved, um, particularly when Westinghouse does not have a legal entity in the destination country. Um, and when a request does come in, global mobility liaises with the usual suspects, so corporate tax, payroll, uh, external individual income tax consultants if we need to, and our export compliance teams so to ultimately make a recommendation to the business. Great, Trish, thanks for that level of detail. I'm sure the audience appreciates that. Uh, just a reminder to the audience, the panelists will be taking questions at the end of the session. So please feel free to post any questions and provide any thumbs up and likes to help prioritize the questions that will be answered. Okay, Melissa, earlier you talked about um, how remote work policy came to fruition as a direct result of your experience during the pandemic. Have there been any other initiatives at MasterCard born from COVID-19? So yeah, so uh, yes, we did talk about the flexibility to work remotely um, anywhere from, I guess, a month to six months because anything under 30 days, we're not that concerned about. So that was born out of COVID. Um, that's something that we haven't done before on a, on a large scale basis. We also had this really incredible thing happen just, you know, weeks, not even maybe one week after the the pandemic hit and, and everyone in the US at least um, went into lockdown. But basically our CEO, we had an all hands meeting and he announced um, the pivoting of our business in order to respond to the pandemic. And this was very close to the beginning where we were looking at, you know, we knew we weren't going to have cross border revenues, you know, and, and different things that were going to change in our business. And we pivoted to try to, to really look at what we could do during this time in order to help others, because that's always a MasterCard. We, you know, it's just the way we are as our culture, but also in order to generate different types of revenue for the company and stay afloat. So um, he asked for volunteers and people to take part of the time of their regular work schedule and help with this project, which we, we, were, call, we were called Project Possible. And the first day he had 100 emails. And then it just kept growing from there. And a lot of people just, you know, donating their time, working on different projects, their skill sets and everything. And out of that was born um, something that we're rolling out more broadly, but it's it's still just being test piloted within HR called Unlocked, which is an AI driven opportunity marketplace online. So eventually every employee will be able to put a profile into this system and search for opportunities that are six months or less that they can help out with on a part-time basis. Um, it's we feel it's a it's a great, you know, it's a great initiative at our company in order to give people some different experiences, but also to um, to really try different things. And um, we do think that this could lead to more mobility based on, you know, people doing it remotely now, but potentially in the future, new roles coming up. So we're very excited about that. Um, 
And then we also implemented pretty quickly, I think within the first two weeks of the pandemic, uh, a COVID leave of 10 business days that can be used to care for yourself, your family members, and then eventually as things evolved, it was used if you needed to get the vaccination or you're recovering from it. So those days were extremely helpful. Um, I, I had to utilize them. My husband unfortunately got COVID, he's fine now, but um, it, was, it was really helpful to me in order to be able to know that my company cared enough to give me that time off to take care of what I had to. So that's been a great initiative. Um, that that came into play and happened real quick. So we did do a lot of pivoting, and um, I really think that coming out of this, it it really uh, we worked together very well as a company in order to to come out of this. So um, it's exciting to see that you know these new things have been developed. Melissa, thanks for sharing. That's great to see what uh, initiatives Mastercard is doing to help support their employees. Okay, let's uh, shift away from mobility policies and dive into locations and challenges that may be arising in different regions. Uh, Marissa, are there any locations that you are finding particularly difficult or challenging at the moment, perhaps in either country restrictions or travel limitations? And what are you and your organization doing to meet those challenges? Sure, I can definitely um, share a few thoughts. So like I said, we we continue to try and get people into various countries uh, during the, the pandemic. One of the most challenging locations, which it's starting to become a little bit easier to get people into, but we had an assignment pending for Argentina for almost a year um, because everything just completely shut down in terms of immigration processing. And on the surface, you know, okay, yes, you had to wait for a year and, and that's a problem in and of itself. But then on the on the back side of that, that meant that we had people in country in Argentina who couldn't leave because there was a contract requirement to fulfill there. And so they couldn't return to their home location for, for over a year um, because we couldn't get any anybody else in in country to relieve them and part of the challenge that Textron has too is when you work on aircraft like an airplane or or a helicopter you are required to be FAA certified and where do you get that certification in the US and so it wasn't as if for us we could just go source someone locally to fulfill some of those needs so Argentina was a challenge for us Australia was also a challenge for us. In some cases in Australia, we were able to send folks in country with a short-term exemption letter from um, the, the branch of the military in Australia that we happened to be working with. So that helped um, to get folks in country, but otherwise Australia was very challenging. Um, the US is actually turning out to be one of our most challenging locations to get people into. Uh, mostly because now employees you know have have been stuck say in a location for a year longer than they were planning on being there and it's now time for them to repatriate and maybe when they were on assignment they happened to marry someone locally so a foreign national and they never started any paperwork for that that spouse to bring them into the US so now it's time for them to repatriate and they're finding that they can't bring their spouse with them, um, which presents lots of challenges in and of itself. So the US is, is a challenge for us right now. Singapore continues to be a challenge for us, mostly just because the dot continues to move in Singapore on uh, quarantine requirements. So I have an employee who's been trying to get into Singapore, Singapore for about a month now and just keeps delaying entry because they keep changing the requirements on on quarantine in Singapore and Indonesia has also been another challenging location for us so uh, their ministry kept publishing uh, yep in two weeks we're going to open up and we're going to start processing visas again and then they would shut things down and then they'd reopen two weeks later and say we're, we're going to do this and then they'd shut things down again and so we had customers waiting in Indonesia that we just couldn't get folks in country because they had completely shut the country down. So those are some some of our top uh, challenging locations that we've we've currently had some experience with. Marissa, thank you. OK, Trish, uh, a very interesting topic on vaccination programs as they're rolled out around the world. Organizations, as I believe you mentioned earlier, it appeared to be tentatively looking at what the impact may be on global mobility going forward. 
can you share what internal conversations are happening at Westinghouse? What are the key questions and challenges that have been identified? And have you come up with any possible solutions to meet them? Yeah, so so I think um, at Westinghouse, the, the preliminary uh, conversation we've had um, is real, has really been around Westinghouse's view on vaccinations and the messaging to our employees. So while the company encourages employees to get vaccinated, the company uh, doesn't require it. Um, uh, and the company has advised managers not to ask employees if they're vaccinated. Um, with the return to office, uh, the company has advised that masks are not required for those who have been vaccinated, but I will say it's an owner system. Um, so the young company is not going to ask employees to confirm that they've been fully vaccinated. Having said that, if the employee is required to have the vaccine in order to perform their job, so let's say Westinghouse's clients requires it before getting onto a nuclear plant, the company will require that the employee be fully vaccinated and show proof of that. Um, and really the same will hold true if, if you know, vaccination, if we talk about we've been talking about these vaccination passports, and what does that really mean for mobility? And we do frequently talk about this during our weekly um, calls with our immigration partner. And really, there's no solid information on what, what that will look like, but we talk about it. So the same will hold true if, you know, the, vac the so-called vaccination passport comes into effect and there's a requirement either from an immigration perspective or an entry to that country requirement. So the company will require the employee be vaccinated. So really, this is as far as the discussion has gone, at least from a mobility perspective at Westinghouse. Um, we will, of course, you know, be closely monitoring the vaccination passport discussion to determine how it will impact our business and our mo global mobility and global immigration program moving forward. Trish, thanks. Certainly yep. a difficult topic. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. That's come about as a result of uh, the pandemic. Okay, so thank you very much to the panelists. That was the last uh, formal question that we have for today. I really appreciate uh, you sharing the experience and managing your international mobility program during the pandemic and beyond. So we are going to move to uh, questions from the audience. So just as a reminder, uh, if you have a question for the panelists, please do post it to uh, the site and we will go through them and see what we can answer for you in the group. So um, I'm going to go ahead and ask uh, the first question that I see with the most likes. Uh, a point system was mentioned for one-off employee considerations. I believe, uh, Marissa, you mentioned that. Uh, the audience is looking for you to elaborate about the point categories and how that's been going. Sure, I'm happy to elaborate. So we actually just launched it and I'm afraid, I'm afraid I can't answer the how's it going yet. I mean, so far so good. It was very well received by senior leaders when we pitched this policy. Yeah, really just a sort of a market-based approach to mobility, which is new for Textron. We've always had a core flex policy, so core benefits that we've given to everyone and then flex or optional benefits that the management team, you know, could offer for someone if they if they needed some additional benefits. Um, so we've always had that kind of benefit, but our, our policy rather. But now it's really uh, a, a cafeteria style program for the expatriation benefits. So all we've tackled so far in the long term assignment policy is what it takes to get someone to the host country and to get them settled. And then once they are in country, they sort of, I guess, revert back to what I'll call just a standard ongoing uh, list of benefits, things like hardship pay, danger pay, cost of living allowance and housing um, and education for their children. So. Um, for, for us, that's kind of a standard subset of ongoing benefits that we just continue to give. But what we have made part of our points-based program is all of the relocation benefits to get them from point A to point B. And so they can choose things like how much temporary living do they need? Do they want to ship household goods or would they rather take a lump sum payment? Do they want to take a home finding trip? Do they want to upgrade to business class travel if they've only been given economy class travel? Um, uh, 
I, I don't know, those are probably, those are the ones that come to my mind just right off the top of my head, but those are the kind of things that they can go in and they can choose um, how many points they want to use to purchase those benefits. And then if they have some money left at the end, or rather some points left at the end, then they can cash out up to a maximum amount to, um, to take a lump sum to cover any costs that may not be included in the policy. I hope that helps. Happy to take any additional questions on that. I'll just add that our company is also in the process of developing a similar policy. Um, it is core flex with core benefits and then the flex has is point based. So similar to, to what Marissa described, um, employees are going to have the option of picking what they want, what's most important to them and their families. And then if there are extra points cashing out um, afterwards uh, for a cash lump sum at a, a kind of a reduced value of the points, but still something better than leaving the points on the table. So um, so that's something we're developing as well. So good to hear, you know, that it's going well so far, Marissa, but it's, yeah, it's something I think we also are, are hoping to add a lot more flexibility into our policies by doing this. Yep, and Westinghouse did the same thing. So we have rolled out this year an international core flex for expatriates, similar to, to you, Marissa, at Textron. And we also just rolled out our international perm transfer core flex. And it's all it's the same, it's points based um, for both of those policies. So we have our core and then we have the flex, which is, which is the points based approach. As we were going through that development, we considered, OK, post COVID, what, what do employees need? So we made some changes to our benefit offerings to help support that. And as you just alluded to, one of those, uh, Marissa, uh, was, you know, the ability to upgrade to another class. A lot of employees don't want to sit in the back of the plane and they might feel a little claustrophobic and too close to the person next to them. So we have given some points to either move forward um, in the same class of travel or to move up to the next class of travel. So we have just gone through the same thing. We have a little bit of runway with the international policy and so far the feedback has been good. Um, without the, a card is plug here, without benefits builder, um, that really would not have been possible for us to roll that out. It would be too administratively cumbersome. Um, so the feedback thus far has been has been positive from, from at least the employee experience perspective. Great, thank you for that. Okay, another very popular question here is there is a lot of conversation about employee exodus. What are your businesses doing to address employee engagement? I'll take this one first. Um, so at MasterCard, we are <clears throat> trying to engage as part of return to office. So we're trying to make that kind of exciting um, with events and food and things like that, you know, different things right now. Um, we're allowed to come into the office any day that we want to, if assuming the office is open, as long as we fill out a questionnaire in advance. But when we are required to return to office in September, two days a week, we really want to engage employees and make it more fun to come back to work. So that's something we're working on, um, but also just tying our messaging in and, and really trying to motivate employees um, as far as you know what we what our future goals of our business are so um you know that's how we're, we're trying to approach it with a fun approach <laughs> but yes there is there is attrition a lot of employees don't want to return to work um full-time they want to work remotely and that is driving a lot of attrition go ahead trish did you have another comment i was just going to say i think westinghouse addressed some of that through the voice of the customer that was completed before the workplace standards policy um, was changed. Uh, there was a strong demand for flexibility. And I be believe through the changes made to the workplace standards policy help support that uh, employee engagement and try to provide more that more flexibility to employees. Other things that we are seeing is managers thinking about how they recruit you know, do we really need that person sitting in headquarters or can they be doing this work from another state or another country? So I think that's another um, area of, of um, supporting that employee engagement. And for Textron, I will say as a company, we are um, very much a in the office environment. There's, there's not a lot of work from home on an ongoing basis. 
And so it has been a challenge and we have certainly seen an exodus of talent. Uh, we returned to the office full time about three weeks ago. Everyone, everyone has been back in the office um, Monday through Friday uh, on a regular basis. And it just so happened that that back to back to the office actually coincided with all of our interns coming in for the summer. So it's actually kind of been interesting to um, watch as we've tried to engage mentors for those employees and had events for those interns and um, just different things for them to have access to to senior leaders and to be able to have access to um, to personnel within the company to help them integrate and give them work and challenge them. And so I think that that has actually the timing has worked out OK for us in terms of re-engaging our traditional workforce as our interns, as we've had a, a flood of interns coming in um, this summer and lots of different events for them. Great, thank you. So one of the other questions that have bubbled up to the top is with flexible remote work policies, how are you tracking where employees are working for payroll and tax reporting purposes? So Melissa, do you wanna take that question to start? I will take it. Um, well, we are currently doing it quite manually. Um, we have identified, I think something like 800 remote workers out of our population of you know, almost 20,000 employees, but we know there are more. Um, so we are tracking the ones that are um, that have a disagreement and that, you know with the end date, we're tracking the permanent moves, we're tracking all the requests that come in just so we can see which ones we're denying and which countries aren't you know feasible. Eventually, we are going to roll out a survey in our workday system that will capture this information so that we have fields in our system so that we can see where people are working remotely. But right now, um, we just have a spreadsheet. It's a kind of a manual way, and we're just relying on our people business partners and, and managers of employees to keep us posted. We've done two surveys already, reach out um, to employees. And again, we'll do this third survey once we define our policy a little further and roll it out just to see where everyone is at. But we know there are many people that we don't know where they are because we find out every day um, people that have even been out of you know their location for over a year and, and the manager hasn't bubbled it up or it hasn't been raised. So there are a lot of people in other locations and we just have to deal with it. I mean, we're just hoping that they're not in, in riskier ones for our business and we, we try to keep them out of those countries. Great, Melissa, thank you. Okay, so here's a philosophical question for the group. If we've determined that it's not business as usual yet, do we believe it will be ever be pre-pandemic mobility? Does anyone have an opinion on that? Well, for Textron, I mean, forevermore, this will, you know, we'll have a, a points-based policy, which actually was one of the things that came out of um, out of the pandemic, just because um, it has really highlighted to us that that everybody. I mean, it was like this before, but even more so now that people have really unique concerns and situations that they're dealing with. And so um, I think that's one of the things that we have learned is um, how much flexibility is is really required um, and needed for our program. I think as a company, we're sort of saying uh, into next year, our supply chain is going to continue to be disrupted, which then means um, our assignments are going to continue to be disrupted. But I, I do feel like um, besides some of the considerations that have been put in place in terms of um, permanent changes to our program, we are we are out there bidding on contracts and um, and things are happening, things are coming in the pipeline. So I do feel like we will get back up to the levels that we had before, at least for Textron, you know, um, because, you know, employees have to be FAA certified or because they have to have certain skill sets from a certain country. I don't know that we'll ever get to the place where we can say, oh, we're going to source employees locally and that is something that we can always do. Um, I just don't think for us that's that's going to be possible and we are seeing lots of different countries with proposals for for our products that we're bidding on and hopefully we'll win those bids so i think come maybe latter part of 2022 we'll start to we'll start to kind of see it be a little bit more normal for us anyway and i would agree I, i'm i don't think we're expecting anything till next year um this certainly this summer is very different than any other summer we've ever experienced because normally that's the busiest time at least to move people at least at our company um, so I, I think we are going to get back, but sometime next year. And I do think we are going to have a lot more flexibility 
if we can have someone do a, a role remotely, I don't think we're going to spend the, the funds to put them on an assignment and separate them, you know, from family and other friends and where they are. So I think we are evaluating things like that more closely, but I do think next year will become back to more normal, I hope. Yeah, and I think from a Westinghouse perspective, it's really this pandemic has changed our culture and our thought process on how we work. Um, and we see that now, the majority, we only have 250 employees who are in the remote category out of 10,000. Uh, the majority of our employees are mobile. So it's really, it's a cultural shift at Westinghouse and a ma mindset shift as to how we work. And I think that, of course, will trickle to mobility. Um, to what Melissa just said, there may be times when, you know, you look at an, uh, an assignment or you look at an international uh, or a perm transfer, any perm transfer for that matter, domestic or international, and decide, does that make sense? Um, does that person really have to move? So we can already see that happening within our mobility program and those discussions taking place. Great, thank you. Okay, a uh, topic on uh, diversity and inclusion uh, is one of the questions, although it wasn't a topic today and uh, from a Cardis relocation playbook, it will be in our future um, edition, but the audience is looking to understand what are the panelists thoughts on this topic within mobility around diversity and inclusion, and if a company doesn't have a policy yet, for example, what are the few steps that they might take to get started? Marissa, do you want to start with that one? Sure, happy to take that. So um, Textron has a, what they call a DIB committee, which stands for Diversity, Inclusion and Belonging. And it's a committee that um, very similar to, to what was said about MasterCard and, and the employees who raised their hand and they wanted to, to jump in and participate and be part of that program. Um, that Melissa was talking about, it, this was one of the committees at Textron that, that people did the same thing, raised their hand and said, we want to be part of this committee. We want to be, we want to be part of this discussion. And so for um, a year, a little over a year, we, we've been having a lot of discussion. We've been hosting, um, you know, internal meetings to learn more about what matters to people and what's important. And we're making decisions to recruit differently and to source talent from, from different locations. Uh, for Textron, though, specifically in terms of mobility, if I think about who we send on assignment, the particular demographic that we send on assignment, we don't send a lot of entry level employees on assignment. Usually our, um, our expats are, are um, mid-level to more senior level employees. And so I think even if you start at the beginning with diversity and inclusion, which is where we are, frankly, in this effort, and try and put some plans in place and try and make an effort to, to move that forward as a company, it, it may take a little bit of time for us to see that in the talent mobility uh, pipeline in terms of expat assignments. I think we're, put, we're setting ourselves up for success. I think we're having all the right discussions and conversations. Um, I think it's just going to take, it, it's a journey for us. It's going to, it's not going to be a sprint to the finish line. It's going to be a marathon that, that happens and evolves over, um, over several years would be my, my prediction there. And I'll also say MasterCard uh, also developed a diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, we have a SharePoint site. We have lots of presentations on it. We have quarterly meetings. And I do think that this is something that absolutely is going to be integrated into our mobility policies going forward. I think it's something we, you know, we can't ignore. And I think it's something that we have to think about for going forward just to make sure that our policies are very um, equitable and that we're giving everyone an opportunity for a mobility experience. So I do think it's definitely going to be integrated more in the future. Yeah, I would agree with what Melissa just said from a mobility policy perspective. That's one of the areas we have hired a new DE&I uh, leader um, who's already brought tremendous value to the organization and, and really brought DE&I to the forefront. Um, and one of the areas that we most likely will see more in the short term is how do we incorporate DE&I into, into our HR policies, which includes global mobility. Yeah. Great, thank you. I'm sure there will be more to come in the next version of the Cardis Relocation Playbook on that topic. 
Okay, so what the audience wants to know, are there any best practices that your companies have adopted during the pandemic that you would not have looked at otherwise, or at least not as quickly, but that has actually made your business better as a result, even beyond the pandemic? Well, definitely what I spoke about, about the priceless possibilities and now how it it, it, um, it has generated this new uh, initiative called Unlocked to allow people to have more opportunities for diversity, uh, you know, for inclusion and also just for mobility opportunities. We, you know, hopefully in the future that will drive assignments, short term assignments, um, maybe more opportunities out of country. And so we're excited about this because um, people are very siloed, you know, in their roles at our company, and it, it's nice to see that people are going to take on some additional work and really get new exposure. It, it feels feels good, you know. Feel people are excited about. It. So I, that's something that we would never have expected. Oh, go ahead, Trish. Oh, I was just going to say uh, one small, uh, as crazy as this sounds, nuance that came out of this and, and a best practice to me is, I personally feel like. Uh, with my peers in the organization and we are dispersed throughout the world and of course we have our headquarters uh, in Cranberry Township, I feel there's a level playing field with all of our, my peers um, working remotely and all of us joining discussions, calls, projects um, together in a remote um, fashion, I really feel like there's more of a level playing field so versus our employees, uh, maybe my peers are sitting in Cranberry and they may be having sidebar discussions and having more interaction about a particular project topic, whereas today that can't happen. So it's been actually a really, really great and rewarding experience for me. I have seen more of my colleagues more than ever, uh, you know, of course, because we are on on um, on, on teams and, and sharing our you know, having our cameras on. I just feel like there's there's been much more interaction and our voices have been heard as a result of how um, we have been working during the pandemic. And I would just quickly add too, I think that maybe you could say um, immigration compliance and tax compliance are best practice, but it wasn't always something that we were incredibly good at. I think as a company, I mean, we, we certainly tried. I'm not saying we were bad at it, but I think sometimes the decision was made, look, you've got to have talent in a particular location. I don't have time to wait for a work permit. We're just we're just going to send them. They're just going to be there for two weeks or, you know, it's no big deal. Um, sometimes we would see that happen. And as interesting as it is, immigration has been a total pain throughout this pandemic, but it has certainly brought more people to my group from a consulting perspective to now say, I, I need to get this person in country and I, I can't. I mean, I'm not making any progress. I can't get them there. And they come to us and we've been able to consult and work with local consulates. And it's sort of been a, a jigsaw puzzle in some cases. Oh, you need to get somebody to the UAE? Well, they're coming from South Africa and nobody's letting anybody in from South Africa right now. So let's send them to Kenya for a couple of weeks. Um, to quarantine there and then they can enter the UAE. And so if anything, I'm hoping that what sticks out of this is that continued focus on immigration compliance and the fact that they would come to the mobility team for consulting and say, how do we make this happen? How do we do the right thing? Um, I'm, I'm hoping that that is something that will will stick. Great, thank you. I think we have time for one last question. Um, and it is how and to what extent is mobility involved with these big picture HR decisions? Trish, do you want to take that? Yeah, so as I think back to developing the or revising the workplace standards policy, um, we global mobility were consulted throughout that process. OK, what can we do? Um, and, you know, what can we do? And, and, and our chief HRO said, why? We just want to work from anywhere. Why not? Why can't we just work from anywhere? So I think we really brought a strategic focus to, to that discussion to explain why. Um, and the same goes for what Marissa just said from an immigration point of view. We do a pretty good job of making sure we have compliance and really educating our, our business. So it's that constant 
uh, dialogue, education, consultation with our business and our business leaders, um, you know, as they think about new projects, make strategic decisions um, in certain countries. Terrific. Excellent. Well, uh, we are at the top of the hour. Special thanks to Marissa, Melissa and Trish for joining me today. Thank you so much for the audience attending our webinar today. Um, look out, we will be sending out a communication from us next week that will include the recording of the session and answers to the questions that we didn't get around to addressing, although I do believe we've gotten to most of them. In the meantime, please don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have any questions. Enjoy the rest of your day and be safe. Thank you.